In the last decade of the 19th century, after Eastman debuted the Kodak, a groundswell of amateur photographers poured into the profession, with many companies either staking their claim in the field or popping up as new opportunistic ventures. The photography industry was a boom town, a bonanza, a sort of gold rush that attracted the artists, the inventors, the capitalists, the dreamers, and the chemists. We can look through catalogs and trade journals of this time and see dozens of short-lived companies who specialized in one gimmick, then seemingly disappeared overnight. I want to focus on one of these gimmick companies, that being the Yale Camera Company, which only existed for maybe two years, I think, until they inexplicably disappeared. The Yale Camera Company was one of those box camera producers and early forerunner of the Kodak Brownie. However, due to their short-lived history, there's not a lot about the company that's out there. All we really have are just ads and they don't tell us a lot. According to the December 1898 issue of the Optical Journal, Yale Camera was incorporated in Chicago with $10,000 of capital stock. Its incorporators were Lyle D. Taylor, Elmer E. Beach, and Guy H. Bynum. There is no other information about any of these men other than they incorporated Yale. They don't appear anywhere else outside of this mention. Yale might have been incorporated in 1897. Remember, news didn't always reach the press junket right away. But what we can say about the Yale Camera Company is that by 1898, they were in full swing. Moving forward, we should not confuse the Yale Camera Company with the Yale Camera Line, which was manufactured by the London-based firm Adams & Company. <sighs> so many wasted hours with that lead. Jesus Christ. The Yale Camera Company primarily sold a small range of box cameras that came in kits. You would construct the camera yourself, then develop the plates yourself using the provided chemicals and accessories. Their flagship product line was the Yale Camera. Go figure. A year later, in 1899, they introduced the Yale Cycle Camera, which they sold for $4.45. There was also the Yale Number no. 2, which was sold for $2, and the Yale Number no. 5, which was sold for $4.65. There's nothing unusual here per se, but they were doing the easily affordable brownie thing before Kodak ever did, especially since their target demographic appears to be children and women and their self-developing process was allegedly optimized enough for anyone to do it. And on that point, most amateurs in this era did not have a readily accessible darkroom. You would either have to invest in one at home, if you could afford it, or, like what most people did, you would have to rent out space temporarily in the back of your local drugstore, like the filthy cockroach that you were. Well, that self-developing kit that came with the camera was Yale's perceived solution to that problem. In fact, you could even evaluate the kit before buying it. And this was the gimmick. According to their ads, you could take the whole kit home for 50 cents and evaluate the contents, which included all the fixings like hypo, printing paper, developers, plates, and toners. Then, if you were satisfied, you would pay the express agent the store, $4.50 plus the express charges, and the whole thing was yours. All of this just to say they accepted a 50 cent down payment. You end up paying full price anyway once you agree to the offer. Now if we do some quick conversions, a 50 cent down payment on a $4.50 base price kit in 1898 comes out to, in our current exchange, a nearly $20 down payment on a $153.37 kit. Actually, that's not bad. Fuck it, I'd buy it. In one of their ads, which appeared in the Chautauquan, dated April 1899, Yale marketed themselves as the largest factory in the world that also sold Kodaks. It's hyperbolic for sure, but I think Yale might have doubled as a retailer, which is not unusual. In those days, many supply houses bought cameras from larger manufacturers like Kodak, e &HT Anthony, Conley, as white label products that they could just graft their own brand name onto. It's possible Yale was one of those companies. In fact, in the ad, it says they offer a catalog, which is probably just an inventory of all their cameras. Wait a second, 31 Randolph Street? I thought it was 37 Randolph Street. 
Wait, it's 35 Randolph Street. Or no, it's 50. I mean, 49 Randolph Street? It's 25 Quincy Street here. Or is it 222 Dearborn Street? Wait, wait. What the fuck is 522 Atlas Building? Okay, hold on. Jesus Christ. Seven address changes. This was all in the span of like two years, by the way. It's one thing to change your address to a new state to avoid taxes or to legitimize yourself, but to change your address to the next block over that many times? It just feels a little scammy to me. At this point, the Yale Camera Company paper trail was virtually non-existent except for like a few ads here and there. But I did find something that was pretty interesting. According to the Paint, Oil, and Drug Review, dated July 6, 1898, a fire began in the Yale Camera Company offices. So we know they endured a fire, but these were just offices. Who gives a shit? Get back to work, you freaks. We have cameras to make. I thought this was the reason the company failed, but I was wrong. The biennial report for the Secretary of State of the State of Illinois, published in 1900, listed Yale Camera as making a profit as late as January 9th, 1899. And this is where the record ends, and the Yale Camera Company just vanishes. The website Historic Camera claims the Yale No. 2 was produced until 1910, but I can't seem to find any advertisements past 1899, at least not in the public domain. It's possible Yale persisted into 1910, but I find it hard to believe. It's possible the company folded, sold off its assets, switched names, or were quietly bought out by a larger company. We'll never know. Keep in mind, it's up to the companies themselves to release public pressers about their dealings. So, Yale Camera might have quietly dissolved and never said anything. I think they existed solely to produce camera kits make a few bucks on the side, and then fucked off once the popularity ended. Coincidentally, a year before the brownie was introduced. George, I see what you're doing. I see what you stepped in and tracked all over the house, you wily fuck! The story of the Yale Camera Company ends just as abruptly as it began. Like so many of its contemporaries, Yale was a flash in the pan. Honestly, it's a shame. I really wish there was more to go on. Yale was sadly eclipsed by other major competitors. We'll never know how many people bought their kits, or how many children would later become photographers because their parents bought the kits for them. So, unfortunately for now, we just have to close the book on the Yale Camera Company. I want to close this video out with a small glimpse of what the real turn of the century looked like. Lots of smiles. Warm faces. Casual and mundane. People being, well, people. We have these rare candid photos thanks to the amateurs. Not the studio jockeys, or the corporate portrait artists, or even the field photographers, but the amateurs. People like you and me. These photos are the fruits of companies like Yale, Seneca, Century, and Western. It's weird to think, but Maybe, if it weren't for them, we might not have these incredible photos. And it's kind of heartening to think that we still have them today. <laughs>